civil society internet governance uh, caucus. He's also an internet analyst and management consultant. And Ian, I think you want to talk about in the last billion as an emerging issue. Thank you very much and good morning everybody. I think it helps in examining subjects like this to, as best we can, pull ourselves away from our immediate environment and as best we can look into the future and see if we can identify some of the issues and some of the factors that we are going to address. So, to me, the next billion is going to happen and happen very rapidly. It'll be over perhaps by the time we meet again. But the last billion, well, it's going to take some time. The first billion took 20 years, as it was pointed. I think by the time we get to the last building, we've got some extraordinary difficulties, and that might take out another 20 years. So, in order to do so, I'd like to welcome you all to IGF 2028. The IGF 2028 meeting is taking place in Reykjavik, Iceland. I'll explain why we're in Reykjavik a little bit into, in, in, into my introduction here. I'm participating virtually from Australia. It's for various reasons and I'm on a high definition conference link from Australia and being able to participate from there. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the other piece of news I must relate 20 years hence is Australia has just beaten India in the cricket for the first time in 20 years. So um, that is a great thrill for me. <laughs> thank you. Um, when I'm talking about the last billion um, I should say that, we, that there are some people who are obviously excluded. We're not talking about the last billion of the world's population. I think we can leave out everybody who arrived yesterday and or probably everybody under the age of about three. But we do start to pick up at the age of about three or four, as I know from my grandchildren who hop on the net and play games. So we do have three and four-year-old users. And I guess there's a number of people who simply don't want to have anything to do with that and that's okay too. So I've excluded those. I'm including in my last billion the people who see that there is advantage for their family, for their children to be connected here and all the advantages that other people have from the internet, they want them. So they're in and we're trying to deal with those. So let's get a profile of where they are as best we can. And um, let me say that quite a few of this last billion are in developed countries. They're in rural pockets which have not been connected and very hard to connect. In countries like Australia, it could be the remote indigenous communities who are amongst the last billion. So we certainly have pockets still in developing countries and we have urban poor in developed countries who will also be part of that last billion. But to a large degree, the last billion will be those who are slower in adopting at this point of time will still be so and that will be the case. So there are areas on the planet that need higher concentration than others in order to bring the equity that does arrive for all of us from having access to this thing. Um, quite a few of the last billion won't be able to read or write. That won't be a problem for them because a lot of the uses they will have will be around gaming or around downloading, um, downloading videos, downloading music, these sort of factors. So that's not a problem but it is an interesting factor because then the tool for literacy that exists with the internet sort of becomes a very interesting thing that starts to come to the fore. So these are the things that are happening. Let's, um, and uh, the other factor that comes in with the last billion that, that, that's very interesting for us is multilingual. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> By the time we get to the last billion and, uh, and some of the languages we have to deal with, it, be, it starts to become quite complex. Let's talk about the devices we use with the last billion and very few of them are going to be computers. Most of them are going to be mobile devices. They're going to be in a mobile world and some of these devices will be mobile phones, some will be sort of the, what we used to call PDAs and there will be all sorts of smaller devices and so on. But the computer won't be amongst the dominant devices at that point of time. That raises some fairly interesting issues and I will come back to those as we start to talk about infrastructure and so on. Um, but you know, as I said before, you know, the, the dominant, some of the dominant media we use at this point of time will not be the dominant internet media with the last billion. Um, the concentration will be more towards what our kids do, which is the downloading, the texting, the games, you know, all of these sort of things come into this space. There's a number of ramifications of this thing with mobile and we'll get to it. But let me talk about some of the issues and, and try and structure this a little bit. And I'm not going to paint the whole picture, but perhaps raise some questions and some ideas which are part of the picture for you to fill in yourself and see how you think we ought to address some of these things. Now, why are we in Reykjavik, Iceland? We're in Iceland because Iceland is the fastest growing 
internet economy on the planet. Iceland, the basket case economically of the Great Depression of 2008, has jumped ahead because of the, um, uh, the major project underway to create the carbon neutral internet. Iceland's vast geothermal resources have been put to use and major server farms, in fact most server farms in Europe, most major locations in Europe, a lot of government um, data centres in Europe have all relocated into Reykjavik to get near the geothermal thing. Other areas of the world with good re renewable energy resources have also jumped ahead too. So there is a great new economy and a great number of new possibilities arising from this. Um, some of the other features that we'll see is most of us will have our biodegradable mobile, mobile phones. Um, we've started with the carbon neutral um, internet to also start to address the major problems of junk. And I, one of my fellow panellists is going to raise these issues later, but in 20 years' time we can start to look at it. In getting this carbon neutral internet, we have started to create a vastly different architecture and start to really, you know, sort of use the way that the internet works in a vastly different way. Now, let's talk about the infrastructure for this because um, you say, OK, we get to the last billion, so it's probably... You know, maybe about the infrastructure, probably about six times what it is at the moment. Well, that would be nice. But one of the factors that's interesting to look at is that the high-end users of internet bandwidth at this point of time are using 10,000 times the bandwidth of the normal inter of the low-end internet user. So there's a vast discrepancy. And what is going to happen is that more of us are going to move to this bigger group of the, you know, the 10,000, you know, sort of um, 10,000 times normal usage sort of pattern of internet usage. And this will happen more and more as, you know, sort of with internet TV downloading, downloading videos, and this will happen more and more, particularly in developing countries. So I don't think we're looking at anything like 6,000 times. We may be looking at 60,000 times the current capacity is needed. I would say conservatively, we are definitely looking at 10,000 times the current capacity by 2028. Now that has a number of ramifications for the way we do things. Um, uh, I should mention too, I just mentioned video, we're not just looking at the recreational video and YouTube downloads, we're looking at major medical use of video, we're looking at um, um, the high image resolution um, conferencing which allows me to participate from Australia, these sort of things are all part of that too. This recreates a number of issues. One of the issues here is infrastructure. Is everybody going to roll out every ISP, every telco going to roll out parallel infrastructure across every country to try and do this? Or are we going to look at shared infrastructure models which make a uh, to create efficiency and to create this global network which we need? Um, now, how are we going to cope with this vastly bigger issue? And what's this going to look like? Well, let me give you a couple of ideas. You know, um, first of all, we are looking at the mobile internet to a very large degree. And as I say, the dominant use will be mobile. Now, at, back in 2008, the mobile device was a, a strange hybrid. It used non-internet standards when it um, connected you by voice, but some of them did, but in fact some of them, the cheaper ones, went over to what was called internet standards to use, and then there was internet standards for data, and then there were other standards that were you know, being introduced, and there was quite a bit of mess. Now, I think eventually to deal with the um, expansion of all of this, it led rise to the new standards um, institution which was created in about 2010, which was the IETFTU. Um, the IETFTU looked to harmonise all the standards which were going on in the telephony area and the internet area to create this big globally connected network. The major work of the IETFTU was the workshop which was trying to reduce the number of standards to less than 10,000. And this was consuming a lot of energy as people started to try and get this to a workable number of standards. Um, however, there was the new organisation which has just arisen. Um, and I, I, I ask you to think about how strong it was. And this was the III. This is the Internet Interconnect Initiative. This was sort of like the WWW. Sort of figured that these other guys were never going to cope the IETF was far too old, far too stayed, like the IETF, the IETF to you didn't get it, and a lot of the innovators had moved to the III. The III was looking at a clean slate approach, and it had, be, be, you know, it had taken place, and many of the users were starting to use the III standards and the new II network. 
the iNetwork had all these wonderful new applications and became the platform for innovation because the other platform had got to the stage where innovation was becoming more and more difficult. And some of the people there remembered the thoughts of Robert Kahn at the IGF way back in 2007 who started to say that the internet standards and the internet standards bodies are starting to ossify and become not capable of handling new areas of innovation. So that was an interesting fact that came in. Now, I should wrap up fairly quickly, but I do have to talk about governance because this is an no, internet governance rule. So what is our governance own way like setting up their regime? Do we have an industry self-regulatory regime dealing with most of these issues? Or do we have some sort of um, a government regime separately? Or, or what is the structure that's going to deal with these tremendous emerging issues around intellectual property and privacy and um, uh, individual rights and human rights? And Could the speaker slow down, please? It's offensive in one country, that not offensive in another, all of these sort of issues. How are we going to deal with those? So as I say, I think we are in lawyer's paradise um, as we start to deal with these jurisdiction issues. So that's about it, I think. Um, I hope 2028 provokes you to start to think. And if I just summarise very quickly, the areas where I think we've got issues are around how we deal with climate change and environment issues, how we deal with infrastructure, how we deal with access, how we deal with ossification and standards, and how we deal with governance as we go forward. So very interested, and I hope I've provoked some thinking. Thank you.